Okay, everyone. So, whoops, we're on the wrong slide. Let's continue. So, um, similar to um, looking at acids and when it is an electrolyte, bases are not always considered to be electrolytes. So, only when in an aqueous solution and when it's in its liquid form, okay? So, the reason why is because when ionic compounds are in liquid form, they also have free-flowing ions, okay? There's no solvent there, but it has the ions that are able to move and flow with one another. As a solid crystal lattice, ionic compounds are not electrolytes. So, the key is you need ions. So as a liquid or as an aqueous solution, you do have electrolyte um, or the ability to conduct electricity. So as I mentioned before, when you have litmus paper, so red color indicates uh, acids. If you have red litmus paper and it turns blue, that will indicate a base. So you can think of it as they both start with the, with the letter B, right? Blue for base. Uh, and of course, we already know this, double displacement reactions of an acid with a base form a neutral solution. So um, this diagram here is just showing you the, um, the litmus paper uh, and what happens. So remember, there's blue litmus paper and red litmus paper. So remember, the key is the change. So in a base, the blue is going to stay blue, but the red will change blue. You see a change from red to blue. Acids, so the red litmus paper is going to stay red, but the blue litmus paper turns red. So they're both red or both blue. Now, the reason why you never want to test with only one type of litmus paper is because if you have a base and your blue litmus paper stays blue, that might also mean that you have a neutral solution. So neutral solutions don't change litmus paper at all. So meaning red litmus paper will stay red and blue litmus paper will stay blue. So if I used only one type of paper, if I only used blue litmus paper here, I won't know is this neutral or is this a base, right? Is this an acid or is this neutral? You have to use both so you can see a change. Okay, so what I'm going to have you do here, you're going to write the equation to represent what's happening. So we have solid hydrogen bromide dissolving in water, sodium chloride dissolving in water, and magnesium hydroxide dissolving in water. So just a reminder, at room temperature, ionic compounds are in their solid form. Okay, so pause the video and give this a try. So remember, you are going to include your states. Of course, if you have ions, you need to put the charge. And after you're done, you're, get, you're then going to tell me, is this a dissociation equation or is it an ionization equation? All right, so let's take a look here. So here we have hydrogen bromide in its solid form. And we're dissolving this in water. Okay, so that means that we are going to now have hydrogen ions and bromine ions. Okay, so because this compound did not start off as being an ionic compound, right, this is going to be ionization. So we're just going to put an I for ionization. And of course, we know that once those two, that uh, high hydrogen bromide is dissolved, it's now hydrobromic acid. Okay, so next we have sodium chloride dissolving in water. So remember, ionic compounds are solid at room temperature. This becomes sodium ions and chlorine ions. And actually, this is already balanced. So because this is an ionic compound that's just simply dissolving, uh, this is considered to be dissociation. All right, so then we have magnesium hydroxide dissolving in water. Okay, so again, an ionic compound is always solid at room temperature. Once this is dissolved, we have one magnesium ion and two hydroxide ions. 
So again, this is classified as dissociation because it's simply taking that crystal lattice shape of our ionic compound and breaking apart the ions, okay? So acids will ionize, bases will dissociate. Uh, and sort pardon me, I said bases dissociate, which is true, but any ionic compound. So sodium chloride is not an acid or a base, but it's still able to dissociate. Right? Okay, so we're going to look at different types of strengths for acids and for bases. So how strong something is considered to be is basically talking about how much does it dissociate or ionize. Okay, so for example, when you have an ionization equation, sometimes not all of this hydrogen bromide will actually make ions. Maybe only 50% of it becomes ions. Okay, that's actually the deciding factor in terms of do you have something that is a strong acid or something that is a weak acid. Strong acids will always ionize more than 99%. Okay, so maybe you'll have 99.9% .9 ionized or 100% ionized. But there are some acids that will only 20% ionize or 5% ionize. So you don't always necessarily have 100% uh, ionization. So when we write this out, we write it as if it is all ionized. Um, but of course, as you learn more and more about acids and bases, you're going to realize that that's not always the case. Same thing for bases. Bases that are strong will 99 plus, so nine, more than 99% dissociate. But there are some bases that will not um, dissociate all the way. So when we talk about a strong acid or strong base or weak acid and weak base, it depends on the degree to which it dissociates or ionizes. Okay, so basically, the more of an ionization or dissociation, the stronger it is. Or in other words, So the more ions that are made in your solution, the higher your strength is of whatever it is, whether it's an acid or a base. More ions means more, I guess you should say, stronger uh, capabilities of ionizing, which kind of goes hand in hand. Okay, so strong bases we'll look at first, because there's more strong bases than there are weak bases, okay? So this should make sense now that you understand what makes up something that's strong. So strong bases have high electrical conductivity. Well, of course, because there's lots of ions there, right? It has a high percentage of, of ionization. So in other words, it is 100% dissociated. So technically, it's anything that's 99% and up. We almost assume that it's going to be all the way dissociated. Okay, so the strongest bases are any group one or group two metal with hydroxide. So anything from the alkaline metal or the alkaline earth metal family is considered to be a strong base when it's with hydroxide. So for example, potassium hydroxide, barium hydroxide, magnesium hydroxide, Sodium hydroxide, anything group one, group two with hydroxide is considered to be strong. Okay, almost all bases are strong. Ooh, I can't even use my mouse properly. So almost all bases are considered to be strong. There's only one weak base that I expect you to know. And that is NH3, ammonia. Okay, but any group one or group two metal with hydroxide is a strong base. Actually, anything that has hydroxide in it typically is strong. 
almost all bases are going to be strong. Okay, so just kind of a visual representation here for you so you can see what I mean by 100% um, dissociated and things that are not 100% dissociated. So these little molecules here are representing uh, um, essentially a compound that's still together. And then when they're apart, they're considered to be dissociated. So they've broken up. So a strong base or even strong acid, it's exactly the same thing. It has only free flowing ions. Whereas if you look at your weak acid or weak base, they work the same way. Not all of them have made ions. Okay, so the more ions, the stronger the item is, whether it's an acid or a base, which goes back to this point. It depends on the degree to which it associate, dissociates or ionizes. The more ionization you have or the more dissociation, same kind of thing, right? The stronger that substance is going to be. So strong acids and weak acids. So there's actually way more weak acids than there are strong acids. There's actually only six strong acids. So for these acids, you essentially have to know them, okay? But of course, I mean, you can just refer to this list. So you have hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, hydrobromic acid, nitric acid, hydroidoic acid, and perchloric acid. So these six acids have high electrical conductivity, again, makes sense, high ionization, so more than 99% ionized. So if you are not dealing with these six, you are to assume that all other acids are weak, unless you're told otherwise. So if I say, you know, um, acid uh, ABC is a strong acid. Like if I tell you something is strong, you're going to obviously know that it's strong. But if we are talking about, you know, hydrofluoric acid or um, nitrous acid, so anything other than these six, unless you're told otherwise, you assume that it is then weak. So weak acids have low conductivity. Why? There are less ions low percentage of ionization. So this is just a generic ranking. Um, it says less than 50% ionized, but technically anything of less than 99% is considered to be weak. So in general, it's under 50%, but you can have acids that are 75%, let's say, and that's still considered to be weak. Okay, a strong acid is only with 99% plus ions. Okay, so just some examples of weak acids. We have carbonic acid here, which is found in um, you know, cans of pop. So usually the weak acids are relatively safe, right? Uh, the strong acids, you don't really even, you don't want to touch these, <laughs> okay? Uh, so acetic acid is vinegar. Nitrous acid, um, it's part of the components. You can find that more in the dental office. Um, but even citric acid we had talked about before, that's a type of weak acid, right? Many, many, there's lots of weak acids, only six strong. So let's take a look at, as an, at an example. So here we have, there, it's hard to see, but there's a little white circle and a big red circle. And when they're together, that means it's before it ionized. So when they hit the water, a strong acid, notice all the white circles and red circles are separated. A weak acid still has some that are connected together. So not all of the ions are made. So it's very similar to that other one where we looked at dissociation. A very, it's exactly the same idea, to be honest. It's just that um, these are not ionic compounds, so we cannot call it dissociation. That's the main difference here.